Happy Advent season to you. May it be blessed and joyful. Uh, we're in Ephesians 2 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 11 to 13. I can't think of a better passage for Advent season than our present passage. If you would look with me in verse 11. After Paul has written that monumental verse, verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. These good works flow out of the new creation tree. Uh, the good works are not what make us the new creation. They are the fruit of the new creation, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 11, therefore, that word matters. Therefore, in light of what I just wrote, Paul says, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, literally handmade. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we, the people of God, have been brought near through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we have been summoned today to remember some things, though, and we just pray that your spirit would overcome the noetic effects of sin that is rampant with us all, that affects our capacity to remember important things. We pray today we would remember, and Lord, in the remembering, our hearts would exalt in our God, our Savior our Redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may remember uh, Patty Hearst, uh, who became internationally known when she was kidnapped in 1974 by the Symbionese Liberation Army. Of course, she was the famous granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst. We mentioned him a few weeks ago, the, the famous newspaper entrepreneur who really was behind the rise of Billy Graham and his international fame. But she became famous in her own right when she was kidnapped by this Liberation Army in 1974. But what really shocked America was after her kidnapping, all of these pictures came out of her allegedly serving this army by her own volition and will. So here you have this picture of this renowned socialite who's now on the enemy side, serving the enemy cause, perpetrating crimes against the citizens of her state. She was arrested 19 months after her kidnapping, and she was sentenced to 35 years in prison. They eventually changed it to seven years. But here was a woman, think about this, who was dead, allegedly, to her country, to her state. She was enslaved to the enemy powers. And as a result, she was condemned. Now, imagine just for a moment if we had a world filled with Patty Hearst. Well, we don't have to imagine it. The Apostle Paul has described that very thing in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. We are all by nature spiritual, Patty Hurst, dead to the kingdom of God, enslaved to the enemy powers, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And as a result, we are by nature objects of wrath. And yet God intervened by his grace. It is by grace we have been saved through faith. This not from ourselves. 
not by works so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship. We are God's poema, his poem, his literary masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But we, by our very nature, even though the old man, the old Adam has been crucified, he raises his head daily in our lives. And as a result, we have a very real tendency to get over grace. We have a real tendency to take grace and God's saving gifts for granted. And as a result, we grow dull in our faith. And, and when you see all of these negative emotions come out, anxiety and discouragement and despair and even sinful uh, expressions of the tongue, slander and, and gossip, we are reflecting a heart that has gotten over grace. And remember, the Apostle Paul is concerned with our good works. God doesn't need our good works, but the world does. Remember, God is summing up all things in heaven and on earth in Jesus Christ. The definitive event has occurred. The achievement has occurred in Jesus. He took the wrath that we deserve. God raised him from the grave. He exalted him to the right hand of the throne. And now he rules by his spirit. And he fills the church. And one day he's going to fill the entire world with his lordship and glory. But he uses means. What are the means he uses to do that? The church doing good works. And so he comes back to our condition. He, he wants to re remind us once again of who we were and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he, he is seeking to stir gratitude and awe. Gratitude and awe is the fuel for good works. Well, that brings us to verse 11, where Paul calls us once again to remember. Remember your past alienation. Notice with me in verse 11. He says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, and he's speaking largely to a Gentile church, though there would have been Jewish Christians in that church, largely a Gentile church, though, um, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So it begins with this conjunction, the word therefore, which connects it to verses 1 to 10. Now, the primary focus of 1 to 10 was our vertical um, reconciliation. Uh, our vertical salvation. So God has saved us and he's reconciled us to, to himself in Jesus Christ. And now he's going to think about the horizontal fruits of that. But Paul is making clear that the horizontal fruits are that. They're the fruits of our vertical reconciliation, our vertical redemption from God. Now, what's interesting is this is our ninth sermon in Ephesians. We're several verses in Ephesians, and we come to our first command. The first command in, the, in the, the book, the letter, is verse 11. We're a people who love commands. Paul is never in a hurry to get to the commands because he understands that why we obey is as important as that we obey. And so he has been intentional in reminding us of what God has accomplished for us in his son, Jesus Christ, so that when we do obey, our hearts are, are obeying out of gratitude and, and, and awe and exaltation and not out of this notion that we think that we can earn some kind of merit or favor with God. So this is the first command in the letter, verse 11. You'll see that word again in verse 12, but that's actually put there by the, the translators. It's not actually in the original Greek. Uh, they put it there in verse 12 for clarity because verse 11 is so long. They added in verse 12 so that we can be uh, reminded that we're continuing to remember what we were. And so verse 11 gives us the first command. And of all the things that we're commanded to do, the first thing we're commanded to do in Ephesians is 
is to remember. Quite remarkable. Remember your former plight prior to you coming to God by faith through his son, Jesus Christ. This is what you were at one time, he says. At one time. Notice that. Remember that at one time. Now, the Israelites were commanded to remember. You see this time and time again in the Old Testament. And what were they called to remember? They were called to remember their enslavement in Egypt, their hopeless state in Egypt. But they were also called to remember the glorious redemption that God had achieved for them through the Passover lamb, the lamb that died in their place. You see that over and over again. Why was Israel called to remember these things? Because again, God had called Israel to be a light to the nations. But you're not going to be a light if you're filled with grumbling and slander and sin. And so they were to always remember so that their hearts would be filled with gratitude and awe. And Paul is saying here, this is healthy. It's healthy to remember where we've come from. Not so that we can beat our heads over, uh, you know, beat ourselves over the head with a hammer because of our guilt. Our guilt's been taken away. He's saying it's healthy to remember where we come from so that we can always be in a state of awe for his grace in his remaking us, his saving us in his son. Now notice, at one time, they, and we get to add we here because we're largely, if not completely, a, a Gentile audience. At one time, we were Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcision, the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So what does that mean? We were called uncircumcision. Well, that was a Jewish ethnic slur. We know what ethnic slurs are today. This was an ethnic slur. It wasn't a, a slur used by every Jew. Not every Jew um, demonstrated any kind of ethnic vainglory. Uh, but there were Judaizers who did and other Jews. This was an ethnic slur that many Gentiles would have heard. This is what we would call ethno Centrism, you know, a, a, a people of any particular ethnicity who takes pride in their ethnicity, uh, which, by the way, is a sin. When you look down your nose at someone who is not of your ethnicity, it's a sin because it violates the law regarding impartiality in judgment and love towards your neighbor. And whoever your neighbor is, that person is the image of God. Every ethnicity is equally the image of God. So Paul is addressing that. Now to be sure, Paul, Paul was very grateful for his heritage, his Jewish heritage. He's, he said in Romans 3 that it was to the Jews that God entrusted the very oracles of God. And he referred to the Jewish people in Romans 9 as his people. And yet Paul, in Christ, as a convert to Jesus Christ, recognized that all of these kind of identity markers are radically demoted in importance when compared to who we are as God's image bearers and for those of us who are Christians, for those of us who are in Christ. At one time, he had taken pride in the fact that he was circumcised on the eighth day. We saw that in Philippians 3, um, that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. But now, circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything to Paul. In fact, in Galatians 5, 6, here's what he says. Circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything but faith working through love. In the construction of the Greek there, you could translate it this way. Circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything but faith working through love 
means everything. In Galatians 6.15, he says faith, uh, circumcision or uncircumcision mean nothing but new creation. Again, you could translate that, but new creation means everything. 1 Corinthians 7.19, he says circumcision or uncircumcision mean anything but keeping the commandments of God. Again, keeping the commandments of God mean everything. So this covenant sign of circumcision, which was the covenant sign of the Abrahamic covenant, had become for some, not all Jews. We don't want to paint with a broad brush here. It had become a dividing line that had led to ethnic pride and ethnic prejudice. Anytime you find your identity in something that is not God himself, that, pers- that very identity becomes an idol. And those who do not attain to that idol, you will by nature look down your nose upon. But this sense of pride, sinful pride, was not of God. It was sin. It was sinfully created by them. Again, notice Paul's language. It's it's almost holy sarcasm. At the second part of verse 11, they were what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Literally handmade. This was not created by God. It was handmade. Now, I would say that about any person or group who finds their identity first in their melanin count rather than in the fact that we all are equally the image of God. And for those who are Christians, we are in Christ. And I would submit that that is behind much of the ethnic tension, the ethnic divide today when any person or any group, and this could be true of any ethnicity, finds their identity first and foremost in the color of their skin. It's causing chaos, absolute chaos. And and that was what some of the Jews were doing. By taking pride in the boundary marker of the covenant sign of circumcision. Paul makes clear elsewhere the the limitations of the physical act of circumcision. He says circumcision actually pointed. It was a a shadow. The, 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 The covenant sign of circumcision was a shadow that pointed to the circumcision that happened on the cross. Colossians 2, where Jesus Christ took our wrath. It was a shadow of the the circumcision of the heart, uh, of the regeneration that occurs by our being in union with this crucified but resurrected Messiah. But this sign had become, for some Jews, a source of idolatry. It's clearly a problem in Ephesus. Indeed, this again, this word handmade, um, it's interesting. It always refers to idols in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It always refers to things idol worshipers have made with their hands that they now worship. It was without exception a negative reference with overtones of idolatry in the Old Testament and even in the New. But having said that, even though ethnic vainglory, ethnic prejudice and pride was sinful and is sinful, it's important for us to understand that prior to the coming of Christ, in the Old Covenant era, It was his design to keep Israel separate from unbelieving pagan Gentiles. Now, as we're going to see, it was for the benefit of, ultimately, these unbelieving Gentiles. But it it had to do with God's calling for Israel 
to the Gentile nations. And that helps us make sense of what we see in verse 12. Notice in verse 12, he says, remember. Again, that verb is not there in the original, but uh, it, it can be rightly placed there to remind us that he is continuing to call us to remember. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. And so what we're going to see here, he's going to give us five deficiencies, okay, with regard to the pagan Gentiles. And he says you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in this world. Now, before we get into these five and break them down, let, let me state something I think that's very important in these days in which we are navigating. There, there's been a whole lot, and we're going to talk about this more next week, conversation about racial reconciliation. But let me submit to you, ultimately, race is a social construct. Because there's only one race. It's the human race. Let's keep that in mind. There's one human race. And that's why different ethnicities can reproduce with one another. Can't reproduce with a dog or a cat. There, there's one human race. So various races, that's a social human construct. One human race, but many ethnicities. That's the more biblical term, ethnicity. So racial classifications aren't real. They're not real. Ethnic classifications are real, and it's glory. So we're not going to lose our ethnicity in the new heavens and the new earth. Every tribe and tongue are going to gather, and your ethnicity, which is beautiful no matter what it is, will be represented in you. Okay? So there's many ethnicities, one race. But having said that, the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles was divinely established by the Lord. All right? Now, now why did he establish? There's, there's a whole lot you could talk about there. But for one, he was seeking to protect Israel. Because Israel would be the custodian of the seed of the woman. You can trace that promise in Genesis 3.15. It's the first gospel promise. The seed of the woman will come and crush the seed of the serpent. And you can trace that seed through Seth, Noah, Shem, and Abraham. All right? And so the seed, the 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 family of the seed had to be protected or there would be no Messiah. Secondly, Israel had a vocation under the Mosaic era, the Mosaic covenant era, and that vocation was to be a holy nation. They were to be set apart. They were to be a light to the nations. Now, where they were situated geographically was remarkably providential. All the world powers had to come through Israel to do uh, commerce. And when they came through, they were to be able to see this is what God's people looks like. And that would come through their fidelity in the obedience of faith to the Mosaic Covenant. And so in a very real sense, it was intentional that Israel and the Gentile pagan nations were separated for a time. And notice he uses five descriptions to describe us, to describe the Gentiles before Christ. First of all, the Gentiles were separated from Christ. That's the main issue. That's always the main issue. That's why it comes first on the list. Now think about this. If Ephesians 1.3 is true, and it is, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. If every spiritual blessing is found in Jesus Christ, then to be separated from Christ is a real problem. 
If Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 is true, and it is, that we are by nature dead in our trespasses and sins. We are by nature enslaved to the powers, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we are by nature objects of wrath. And we are redeemed out of that in Jesus Christ. Then to be separated from Christ is a real problem. Of course, this was true of any Jew as well. The Jews were and are saved the same way we are saved. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's not two plans of salvation. But unlike the Jews, the Gentiles' religion had no messianic expectation. The, the Gentiles were by nature polytheistic. They worshiped many gods. And, and you, would, you would seek to satisfy the gods, oftentimes through child sacrifice. That was something common in, in the Canaan land, for, for instance. You, it was by your merit. There was no Messiah. You were your own Messiah. But Israel had in their very covenants the promise of becoming Messiah. In fact, that's the point Paul makes in Romans 9. Listen to these words in Romans 9, verse 4. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, of course that word their race should be translated ethnicity, it's an unfortunate English translation, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Is the Christ. In our condition prior to our conversion, we were separated from Christ. And apart from repentance and faith, that is the condition of every person here. Separated from Christ. God has never had a grandchild. It comes to adopting grace, by grace through faith in Jesus. Secondly, they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. It is hard, I would say, impossible to put ourselves in the shoes of the first century Gentiles and to understand the alienation that existed between Jews and Gentiles. The ethnic divide that we see in our culture, which is sinful, it pales in comparison. There is no ethnic divide in our culture. It's all JV compared to the divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now that divide was largely due to Israel's own sin and the Gentiles' sin. But having said that, there were laws put into place. And one of the purposes of the laws, for instance, that you see in Leviticus was to keep the, the people of God, Israel, from normalizing relationships with the Gentiles. In fact, the food laws, have you ever wondered why these food laws were there? You've heard people say, well, it was for health. Well, maybe so. Though I think shrimp is pretty healthy. Uh, the, the food laws were in large measure given so that the Jews would not be able to share meals with the pagan Gentiles. There were so many things that the Gentiles could not or, or could eat and that the Jews could not eat. Now, ultimately, this was for the Gentiles' good. The Messiah is coming through, the, through, through Israel, but they had to be kept pure. They had to be protected. And many of the laws were designed to set Israel apart and make them distinct as a holy nation. And of course, in, in Paul's own day, the temple was a, a massive illustration. We'll talk more about that next week. Suffice to say, in the temple, there were places that the Gentiles couldn't worship. The Jews could worship, but the Gentiles could not worship upon pain of death. Was intended to keep them separate. Although all human beings are, are alienated from God because of sin, 
The Gentiles were also alienated from the people of God. Third, they were strangers to the covenants of promise. I want you to note something. The word covenants is plural. Promise is singular. Of course, we know all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. But there were several covenants. You could translate this, in fact, the covenants which embodied the promise of God. I love that. Singular. Not the promises, the covenants which embodied the promise of God. And you could say these covenants were fivefold. You want to add the new covenant, six. But fivefold under the Old Testament. You had the covenant made with Adam. He represented us, right? Romans 5 makes that clear. And he represents us and... And instead of obeying God, he goes rogue, he disobeys, and and sin enters the world, and and the curse falls on humanity and on all the created order. And yet even in the midst of that, God promises a seed will come who will crush the seed of the serpent who was ultimately behind that apostasy. And, and, And then the covenant made with Noah He promises, I will never flood the earth again. He promises a stage so that that Messiah could come. Uh, He promises that the Messiah is going to come and and nothing's going to happen to the earth again that's going to stop that. That's, that's, That's the benefit of the Noahic covenant. There will not be another universal catastrophe. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to fix what's been broken. And then we learn in the Abrahamic covenant that it's going to be through Abraham's family that the seed will come. Now, I want you to think about the Abrahamic covenant uh, as a two-stage process. First of all, he tells Abraham to go into the land where he would make him a great nation. And, And that is fulfilled under the Mosaic covenant. God uses the Mosaic covenant. This will be the means to make them great. They're... The, the people great in the land by their fidelity to the Mosaic Covenant. The second stage, he promises to bless the nations by this seed. He promises to bless the nations. It's through the Abrahamic Covenant that the nations that are under the curse of God will have the curse removed as far as the curse is found. Sounds like a Christmas song, doesn't it? And we learn through the Davidic Covenant that it's going to be through David. It's going to be through David's line. That's what we learned in 2 Samuel 7, correct? See how these covenants connect with each other? And then we see that blessing is ultimately fulfilled in the Messiah, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, the promise. And all of those, that promise was seen in those various covenants. Through the progression of these covenants, God promised to send the Messiah to reverse the curse. But the Gentiles, they were strangers to these blessings. They were Gentile converts, of course. We see them. There was a Rahab here and there. But in the main, they were strangers to these blessings. But you could say in all actuality, this is true of all unbelievers. It's true of unbelievers who go to church every Sunday. Across the world, there are people who faithfully attend church who are not in Christ. And what is said here is still true of them. I love what Martin Lord Jones says about this. They can read their Bible and it does not move them. They can look at these exceeding great and precious promises and say, to whom does this apply? What is this all about? They are strangers. They're like people from another country. They may be your flesh and blood. They're like people from another country. They do not understand the language. Remember that in Christmas season when you spend more time with your family. Don't get frustrated with them. They don't understand the language. 
They need the Spirit's converting grace. Fourth, as a result, they had no hope. Prior to our conversion, we had no hope. They had no hope of a messianic salvation or a future resurrection. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we as believers, when, an, um, when one of our believing loved ones die, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those without hope. Christ being the key here. And I want you to notice those two words. Just fixate on them just a moment. No hope. No hope. Now, all of us have felt that in various instances in our lives. There's a job you want, and you think, I have no hope of getting that job. There, there's a scholarship that you desire, and you think, I, I have no hope of getting that scholarship. Or perhaps it's a health condition, a health crisis, and, and you just feel hopeless in that health condition. Or maybe you're an athlete, and you just have no hope of seeing the field. We've all had those moments where it just felt hopeless. But here, Paul is saying absolutely and comprehensively, no hope. That's horrifying language. He doesn't even mention circumstances. You could be well-to-do. You, you could be prospering. You could be a legend in your field. You could have more money than you could ever dream. The circumstances don't matter to Paul. Paul says, apart from Christ, no hope. You know, most things that uh, we hope for in this life, we tend to hope in the creation rather than our God, they have a very short shelf life. And most of us are around the corner from having our hopes dashed again. That's the nature of hoping in something in the created order. A short shelf life. And, and that's why we bounce from hope to hope. Hoping that the things we're placing our hope in now won't fail us like the last thing failed us. Horizontal hope. And what I mean by horizontal hope is where you're looking to circumstances, you're looking to people, you're looking to a location, you're looking to a change. Horizontal hope will hook us like a drug, but it will never fulfill us, ever, ever ever fulfill us. And that's why in the end, Paul says, no hope. No hope. That's who we were. That's who we were. That's who everyone is, apart from saving faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, here's the fifth condition. They were without God in the world. Now, what's ironic, ironic is the the Gentiles worshipped many more gods than Israel worshipped. But they were false gods. And, and even the most ardent atheists today in our world, and I think there's a whole lot less atheists than, uh, than we recognize because our hearts are hardwired from God. Even the most ardent atheists, though, have a false god that they worship. It's usually themselves. And yet, without the true and living God, we are without God in the world. There's no relationship with the true and living God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, that we celebrate in Advent season. And Paul is saying, as we go into Advent season, it is vital that every Christian at Fisherville here this morning Pause, pause, and remember where we were apart from Jesus Christ. That no matter who we are and how much we may be flourishing in areas of our life, 
apart from Christ, we were godless and hopeless. That brings us to the good news. He doesn't leave us in the bad news, does he? Praise God for that. The world will leave you in the bad news. The world is all law. Do this and live. God always has a gospel. He says, remember your past alienation, but remember your past redemption, which is a present redemption as well. Notice with me in verse 13. But now, but now, I pray every person here this morning can say that. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. So this verse represents a glorious shift, and it reminds us of verse 4. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 4, after describing our condition of being dead and enslaved and condemned, but God, being rich in mercy... Because of his great love for us, made us alive even when we were dead. Again, Paul gives us that glorious but. But now, in Christ Jesus, you were once far away, far off have been brought near. A very common Old Testament way to talk about knowing and experiencing the true and living God that we know as triune was to be drawn near to him or for him to be drawn near to us. For instance, Deuteronomy 4, 7. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? Or Psalm 148, he has raised up a horn for his people. Of course, that horn is in the line of David. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. And here, Paul says, Gentiles, Gentile believers, there was a time when you were far off from God. Of course, there were obviously Jews that were far off, far off as well. You, you don't go to heaven just because you're a Jew. Paul makes that clear in Romans 9 to 11. Under the old covenant, you had unbelieving and believing Jews. He's referring here to the believing Jews, those who believed in a coming Messiah, those who faithfully observed the ceremonial system, recognizing they were sinners and that their sin deserved death and that God was judging their sin in the sacrifice. He says to those believers. You were near to him. And here he says. There was a time you were far off. But now. In his mercy. He has come near to you. But here's the question. How? How can a God. Who is infinite. Eternal. And unchangeable. Now think about those three. Adjectives. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his holiness. We can't even envision infinite holiness. We can't even envision eternal holiness or immutable, unchanging holiness. It never changes. How can a God who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his holiness be brought near? Didn't we learn in the Old Testament that even a priest who went into the Holy of Holies without being fit would be put to death? Well, Paul answers the question right here. And by the way, this is going to be key because the way reconciliation occurs today is the way reconciliation occurred then. It doesn't come by reparations. That's insane. It is a foreign, pagan, antichrist philosophy. Here's how it occurs right here. We'll, we'll hit this again next week. Now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
by the blood of Christ. That's how we and every person who will ever go to heaven is brought near. It is by the blood. Now, in the Old Testament, they were saved on credit because the, the, the debt would be paid later, right? We, on this side of the cross, are saved by debit. We know the difference between a credit and a debit card. The money's already been put in the, in, on the card. We're saved by debit. But we were saved the same way. We're brought near by the blood of this, this Christ. So God sent his son into the far country for those of us who were far away. And in the far country, he paid our debt so that we may be brought near. And as we're going to see in verse 18, for through him we both, who's we? Jews and Gentiles, every ethnicity fill in the blank. For through him we both, we all have access in one spirit to the Father. And what better way uh, today than to, to drive home that we've been brought near than the table? You know, according to the scriptures, the supper, the Lord's table, is a real meal. It's a real meal whose host is Christ himself. He's the host of this meal. Uh, it's a memorial of the sacrifice that was made on the cross, which expresses the reality that all believers have been brought near to God through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 